Greetings, RF Village. We got another good talk coming up about some uh, 802 uh, Pay attention. It's good stuff. All right, I'm going to turn it over to the speakers so we can get this on time, get them out of here, uh, and then we got another great talk right after that. All right, let's do it. All right, thank you guys. I'm Ron Broberg. I'm with Rob Van Etta. We're here to talk about 802.11ah Halo, which is a 9 megahertz, uh, 900 megahertz Wi-Fi uh, protocol. And with that, uh, hand it to Rob, and he'll take you through it. Okay, yep, so today we're going to uh, look at the 900 megahertz Halo Wi-Fi protocol. And to go over this, we uh, kind of focused on this Taijin uh, TX8301 uh, chipset. Uh, reason for this, um, I'll get to in a second, but uh, some of the characteristics of the Halo Wi-Fi. Uh, the reason that uh, the standard was developed was to help increase the range that Wi-Fi can reach. So by using the 900 megahertz uh, frequencies, they have better penetration and further distances that they can go. Uh, but of course, with that comes lower speeds. Uh, typically, uh, the speeds are still adequate for what most IoT devices use. So there's a lot of IoT uh, devices being developed uh, that are using Halo Wi-Fi. Uh, the low power uh, considerations are also uh, built into the standards, so IoT devices uh, don't have to use as much energy. And they also have a higher client count than a lot of the other wireless standards, going up to 8,000 plus clients. Uh, the chipsets that uh, are currently out there, the, the big three, there are some other chipset manufacturers out there, and I don't want to uh, discount them, but the big three that are currently leading the market tend to be uh, from Morse Micro, Nuricom, and Taijin. Uh, we focus this talk on Taijin uh, mainly because if you go to uh, like some of the big search, excuse me, some of the big uh, sales companies out there, uh, and you look at what comes up top on the list when you type in Halo Wi-Fi, uh, if you ignore the first couple there that are just advertisements, uh, five of the six that are up here are all from the same chipset manufacturer. Uh, and then the sixth one there at the end, that's separate, not part of this talk. But you can see that the cheapest ones that are out there, the most common ones, are all going to be the same chipset. Uh, one thing to note, too, on the right there, uh, this is a uh, Wi-Fi wi Alliance standard, so it is certified. This chip that we're going over is considered uh, WPA3 compliant according to the Wi-Fi Alliance. Uh, I have questions about that, but we'll get to that in a moment. Want to take over? Uh, okay. Okay, so with these, when you get the standard box, uh, the typical OEM configuration is one will have a TX sticker, one will have an RX sticker. The uh, TX is for your station, your RX is your access point. The uh, internally, if you open them up, uh, that's where most of the user configuration is meant to be. Uh, there is a switch to set it to the mode, so you can change it just by changing the, the switch from one position to the other. Uh, you can also do it through a CLI. There are problems with configuring it through the CLI that we'll get to here in a moment. Uh, when you do receive them in the mail, they work right out of the box. It's one of the points they advertise is that they are configured and encrypted. You shouldn't have to do anything specific to set it up. Uh, there are concerns about the encryptions. We'll get over here in a second as well. Uh, but they are correct that it does work out of the box. And for most users, if you plug it in, it will work point A to point B. Uh, if you do need to pair them, just like there's a switch inside, there is a button for pairing. Uh, the process is generally that you just hold one down, tap the button on the other devices, as many as you want to pair at the same time, and then release, and they should pair. Again, more or less works. There are some issues with it. Uh, and there's definitely security concerns with it, but it is functional. Um, and uh, the last point there, they, they support from the manufacturer that it supports WPA2, which contradicts the certification saying that it supports WPA3. Uh, it's a little interesting. Uh, a little more research probably to be done there. Uh, but that all kind of goes together with the security concerns that we're going to raise. So one of them is the tools that they provide. To get the actual tools to configure this, if you want to set your own wireless key, you have to register as a developer on the website. Uh, that top picture there shows how on the website, it's a lock by it. If you want to get any of these tools, you have to register as a, a developer, uh, agree to a Chinese uh, user agreement, which if you don't know how to read it, you know, don't know what you're agreeing to. So uh, some people have taken the files, put them up online. Uh, you can download them. And the ones that you download, at least, 
Uh, be careful if you do find them elsewhere. Uh, running from virus total, it could be false positives for sure, uh, but there is some concerns with at least uh, one of the tools that were uploaded publicly. Uh, and again, that's not from the manufacturer's website, so I'm not trying to say that's theirs. Some people have mirrored it, and I can't confirm without agreeing to the SDK that that you know, it hasn't been changed. Uh, fortunately, there is uh, a Linux repo out there. Somebody has put some source code out. Uh, if you go to that project name there at the bottom, it does have uh, some code you can build yourself. You can look it through, make sure it's clean, and uh, configure the device that way. Now, part of the problem with this is, if you look back at the very beginning, you looked at a Halo Wi-Fi thing on uh, just your normal marketplace. You bought it, you used it, it's supposed to work out of the box. But now you're having to compile your own code uh, just to cleanly configure this device. This is very counterintuitive for most users. They're not going to be able to configure this in a secure manner. Uh, so they're going to be left just using it with out-of-the-box configuration. And um, we'll go over uh, the issues with this now. Uh, the pairing process. Uh, if you go ahead and get a UART by opening the device, uh, just listening to the right pins on there, uh, and watch the output, when you do the pairing, uh, if you hold down the button, the access point will send out a pairing request, broadcast, and then any of the clients will listen for it. Uh, then when you push the button on the client, it knows to respond back, saying I'd like to join the network. And this is the whole process uh, as long as you're holding the buttons. It keeps repeating the process as you hit them, so it's a little wonky. Uh, it's microcontroller based, so it's not super sophisticated, but it works. Uh, but what you don't see in this is uh, a secure key exchange. Uh, something you might expect uh, for a wireless pairing process, uh, which again, we looked at this and this, this kind of concerned us. So if you look at it uh, using those tools uh, through that you can download from that Git repo, uh, connect to it, one of the commands you can run here is this uh, WNBCFG. Uh, they use the, like the Hayes AT modem command. Uh, so if you run this, you can see on here the uh, SSID highlighted uh, at the beginning there is basically the exact same as the MAC address. So with a default pairing, it just takes the MAC address, removes the colons, sets it as the SSID. Uh, but then when you look at the pre-shared key there at the bottom, all they did was they took the MAC address, reversed it, put it forward, reversed it, put it forward, and so forth. So the entire key length is just the MAC address, or it's derived from the MAC address. So if you can sniff and see a MAC address, you have the key for that network. That is the whole security of this whole system, how it's developed, uh, as far as we can tell. Uh, this, if that's not raising the alarm bells, you know, uh, you could just drive around anywhere, sniff someone's Mac, and grab all of their traffic. There are some security measures that might prevent you from joining the network itself, but nothing that would keep you from decoding everything that you were able to intercept. So, for what that's worth. All right, radio frequencies. I'm going to hand this over. Um, I would like to comment on that uh, previous, we don't have the slide in here, but we were able to use a new Rakam uh, Raspberry Pi hat in order to sniff the traffic between the two nodes and the bridge here. So that MAC address we're referring to, the ESSID is, a uh, BSSID is visible on the air, even with the tools that are out there now. Um, but we were hoping to push the tooling a little further than that. The Raspberry hot Hat Nuracom uh, device is kind of sketchy in you know, certain ways. What they've done is they've taken the 802.11ah channel mapping, um, which is significantly, how do I make that? Which is significantly different than uh, 802.11, say, uh, N. Uh, and they've mapped the channel definitions for 802.11ah into a standard 802.11 Mac um, Linux stack. And so there's kind of some inflexibility in that process. So we were hoping to get a more flexible tool based on SDRs that would allow us to um, be able to match the actual configuration that uh, is possible in the full 802.11ah stack. We weren't. Um, but very broadly, uh, this protocol is operating in 902 to the 928 megahertz. That gets divided um, based on how wide the bandwidth is. So if you have uh, an eight megahertz bandwidth, that you get three different uh, channels to work with. And those in turn are subdivided into smaller data and control channels. Uh, standard is uh, typically uh, two or four megahertz. Uh, and so you, because you get more channels out of that, 
but the, you know, there's that trade-off between uh, how broad you your channels are, which gives you um, wider data, or versus the number that you have, which gives you um, uh, more uh, more streams to work with. But regardless, the concept here is that you'll you're not going to get as much data through these pipes as you do in your standard 2.4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz, 6 gigahertz now, uh, 8 to 11. Uh, it's not designed for bandwidth, it's designed for distance and power. Uh, I'm calling this slide up uh, just to note, this is the configuration screen that you would see if you were in that AT-based uh, command line terminal, uh, serial terminal. So here we've logged into one of these little Taijin uh, bridge devices, uh, and you, we do that over the network. So you basically just take your network cable, you run it to your PC, and uh, you set up a static IP address there. The device itself does not pick up a network address. It's, um, uh, it's transparent in that sense as a bridge. Uh, but uh, on the other side, you set up the second side of that bridge, and you're able to ping and uh, send data back and forth. The reason why I called this up is because right in here, you might be able to see that channel list. This is an eight uh, megahertz bandwidth, so that 900 uh, um, width for the protocol can be divided into three channels. And here they're defined as uh, 908, 916, and 924. And then that's the efficient division of, of what's available for 802.11ah. If you decrease the bandwidth, then you get more channels available. Uh, the, here's our first capture, uh, and you can see that, uh, that pretty clean stack there at 915. This is actually 916, but then it takes the um, megahertz or two below that as where it's going to be pushing its data. And you can see a pretty... Uh, oh, Oh, I'm sorry, uh, these got in reverse order. But what you'll see here is a, each of those little spikes, that's the subdivision going on within that particular channel for the different, uh, different bands. Uh, here you can see the notching to define the, the actual width of that channel that's being used. And remember, this is only one of the three, so you need to be able to have uh, full coverage in order to capture everything you might need for uh, a tool like a new radio. Um, there has been some work being done. Uh, in addition to the two that I've called out here, there was a master's paper I pulled out of a college in Brazil, but unfortunately I lost the copy that I had and I wasn't able to Google it back up in time for this, but I did want to call his was the first one I saw, but he did not publish code, but he was also working towards GNU Radio and he also got the physical and Mac layer. Uh, uh, Daniel, and I'm sure I'm going to slaughter this, uh, Renislavic, uh, has done some work. This was much more recent, about 2020, I believe, and uh, he did publish his, and so that's out there. And he 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 uh, he states that he has a complete stack for the f the physical Mac again, uh, but it only seems to work in, in the simulation mode. Uh, when I was trying to get this for the actual capture and decode, I wasn't able to pull any Macs with it. Uh, and currently, right now, uh, Samuel Miller is uh, just releasing some code that's also uh, um, working on the Mac and phys physical and Mac layers. Uh, his code actually, while immature, I've been following his notes, and he seems to have a pretty good uh, technical grasp of what he's doing, and he's probably the guy who's going to come out uh, first with working code for this. And uh, so um, I haven't been able to contact him. I just saw this uh, pretty recently, and so I'm giving him a call out here. Uh, follow his code on uh, GitHub if you're interested. So what is the use cases for this? Um, the reason why we got interested is we're with Dark Wolf Solutions and we hack drones. And there has been some talk recently about using Wi-Fi for drones. I'll come back to this one. Um, and that's how we got kind of uh, um, uh, pointed in this direction. There's been some talk in the Pilot channels about this particular chipset. The guy who did the recompilation of uh, the AT command tool, he's also working uh, on the drone sets. So we wanted to kind of get an early look at what they were looking at. There have been some test flights done uh, hooking up 
just the standard 802.11 uh, bridges that we have, 80AH bridges that are available now, uh, and to drones for radio comms, and they work fine. Uh, and in addition to that, there are a couple of companies now offering 802.11AH drone communication models, or UAS. And so that's where we're kind of poking at. Uh, these don't seem to be high volume items though, and uh, so we're still on leading edge, bleeding edge, if there's an, a, really a product case to be made at all. There certainly is for long range, low power comms in UAS, just not sure if this is a solution yet, but I'm wondering if with Taijin, which has got a much cheaper chipset than we've seen from Nuracom, uh, and their ubiquity in Halo IP cameras, uh, if they were going to see a little more um, uh, momentum in the drone side of the, of the game. This is what's going to drive the cost for them. Uh, they're producing these in bulk apparently for remote cameras, security cameras, low, obviously the low power and high range is useful for covering a wide uh, area of a campus or something. And uh, this is where you see actual products. In addition, on these Taijin boards that we're working with, and in addition to the bridges, there's a Taijin uh, dev kits out there, and there is LilyGo just released. Matter of fact, let's pull that up. We have time for that one. Can you pull that up? Uh, LilyGo has uh, released uh, their T Halo uh, device, which combines an ESP32, a Taijin chip, and a network stack. So you can either you can actually flip the mode between ESP32 or network, and it. All of these boards come with uh, camera interfaces, uh, video feed interfaces, because that's what they're really pushing from the development side, as I said. It seems to be the, the real use case. Uh, these things are available fairly inexpensively, I think. I picked them up for 30 bucks a piece from Lilygo. However, they appear to be sold out now. I jumped on them, and that was like three weeks ago, so uh, there's some interest out there at least. All right. Uh, we got plenty of time. Are there any questions about the Taijin chips, uh, about the SDKs that are available for them, the different form factors we've seen, or any of the use cases? We're happy to take those. All right. We thank you for your attention. Uh, watch us in the drone field. If you start seeing more drones popping up with 802.11ah, we're going to be pursuing as hard as we can. And uh, we're also keeping a really close eye and we'll be uh, doing what we can to help spur the development of uh, the GNU radio modules, which are based on really the GR IEE 802.11 uh, module. So we're uh, seeing development on that side and we want to be uh, helpful in, in that effort any way we can. All right. Uh, Rob and I, we thank you.